some people completely reject all of LLMs and they are just uh, writing by scratch. I think this is probably not the, the right thing to do anymore. Um, the intermediate part, which is where I am, is you still write a lot of things from scratch, but you use uh, the autocomplete uh, that's basically uh, available now from these models. So when you start writing out a little piece of it, it will it will autocomplete for you, and you can just tap through, yeah. and most of the time it's correct. Sometimes it's not, and you edit it. But you're still very much the um, sort of architect of what you're writing. And then there's the, you know, vibe coding, uh, you know, hi, please implement this or that, uh, you know, enter, and then let the model do it. Yeah. And that's the agents. Um, I do feel like the agents work in very specific settings, and I would use them in specific settings. But again, these are all tools available to you, and you have to like learn what, they, what they're good at and what they're right. not good at and when to use them. So the agents are actually pretty good, for example, if you're doing boilerplate stuff. Yeah. Boilerplate code that's like just copy-paste you know, copy stuff, they're yeah. very good at that. They're very good at stuff that occurs very often in the internet um, because there's lots of examples of it in the training sets of these models. Um, so, so there's like features of things that where the models will do very well. I would say NanoChat is not an example of this because uh, it's a fairly unique repository. There's not that much code, I think, in the way that I've structured it. And, um, and it's not boilerplate code. It's like actually like intellectually intense code almost. Mm -hmm. And everything has to be very precisely arranged. And the models were always trying to, they kept trying to, I mean, they have so many cognitive deficits, mm -hmm. right? So one example, they keep trying to, they keep misunderstanding the code, um, because they they have too much memory from all the typical ways of doing things on mm -hmm. the internet that I just wasn't adopting. Uh, so the models, for example, I mean, I don't know if I want to get into the full details, but they keep they keep um, they keep thinking I'm writing normal code and I'm not. <laughs> Maybe one example. I think Maybe one example is uh, so the way to synchronize. So you have eight GPUs yeah. that are all doing forward and backwards. The way to synchronize gradients between them is to use a distributed data parallel container of PyTorch which automatically does all the, as you're doing the backward, it will start communicating yeah. and synchronizing gradients. I didn't use DDP because I didn't want to use it because it's not necessary. So I threw it out. And I basically wrote my own synchronization routine that's inside the step of the optimizer. And so the models were trying to get me to use the DDP <laughs> container. Yeah. And they were very concerned about, okay, this gets way too technical. But I wasn't using that container because I don't need it. And I have a custom implementation of yeah. something like it. And they just couldn't internalize that you had your own. Yeah, they couldn't. They, they couldn't get past that. And then um, they kept trying to like mess up the style. Like they're way too over defensive. They make all these try catch statements. Yeah. They keep trying to make a production code base. And I have a bunch of assumptions in my code, and it's okay. And uh, and it's just like I don't need all this extra stuff in there. And so I just kind of feel like they're bloating the code base. They're bloating the complexity. They keep misunderstanding. They're using deprecated APIs a bunch of times. So it's total mess. Um, and uh, it's just it's just not net useful. I can go in, I can clean it up, but it's not net useful. I also feel like it's kind of annoying to have to like type out what I want in English because it's just too much typing. Like if I just navigate to the part of the code that I want and I go where I where I know the code has to appear and I start typing out the first three letters, autocomplete gets it and just gives right. you the code. And so I think it's this is a very high information bandwidth to specify what you want. It's if you point to the code where you want it and you type out the first few pieces, yeah, and the model will complete it. So I guess what I mean is. Um, I think these models are good in certain parts of the stack. I actually use the models a little bit in, um, there are two examples where I actually use the models that I think are illustrative. Uh, one was when I generate the report, that's actually more boilerplate-y. So I actually vibe coded part partially some of that stuff. That was fine. Um, because it's not like mission critical stuff mm -hmm. and it works fine. And then the other part is when I was rewriting the tokenizer uh, in Rust. Uh, I'm actually not as good at Rust because I'm fairly new to Rust. So I was doing, there's a bit of vibe coding going on uh, in when I was writing some of the Rust code. But I had Python implementation that I fully understand, and I'm just making sure I'm making a more efficient version of it, and mm -hmm. I have tests. So I feel safer doing that stuff. Um, and so basically they lower, or like they increase accessibility to uh, languages or paradigms that you might not, as be, not be as familiar with. Uh, so I think they're very helpful there as well. Yeah. Uh, because there's a ton of Rust code out there. The models are actually pretty good at it. I happen to not know that much about it. So the models are very useful right. there. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.